Yeah, well, uh, well, thank you, Shenji, for inviting me. Actually, this was supposed to be an in-person visit, and because of the pandemic, everything uh, changed to be online. But I'm sure in the future, uh, when we have the, uh, all these uh, vaccines, and uh, they're on the horizon, and the future, maybe I'll be able to sure. visit Yeah, again. we definitely would like to host you in the future. <laughs> anyway, but it's still a pleasure to... Uh, to meet uh, everyone online to talk about some uh, very recent work. And uh, uh, this work, this, uh, as you can see from the, uh, the abstract, it covers a, a pretty wide range of things. And, and many, many people uh, contributed to this uh, uh, work. And, and some are students, some are colleagues from in other places, some are former students. And, uh, and they, their contribution is, is uh, invaluable. And I need to explain, and uh, what you're going to hear is, uh, is going to be very brief because there's so many things to cover. And it will sound like uh, I'll, I'll be just making claims without a lot of uh, <laughs> explaining the details and facts and evidence. But you can be sure that, that uh, every, every line, uh, on <laughs> every curve on, on each diagram is, uh, uh, is after a, a very a careful study, a lot of hard work in the uh, in the background. Anyway, but uh, my talk will be uh, uh, will be at a higher level, and I will not go into details. But we, uh, <clears throat> I'll be happy to discuss details after talk anytime, uh, either uh, online or by email. Yeah. Okay. Let me start. So uh, I will talk about the the four augmented work. Oops. How do I? Okay, yeah, and uh, uh, subduction zone is our uh, subject, and uh, and uh, something you, this group, uh, uh, study very actively, and so you all know the subduction zone setting. We have uh, the incoming plate, the upper plate, the mental wedge flow, we had uh, dehydration, hydration, and uh, the 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 subject of this particular seminar is. Uh, I think uh, I keep having problem advancing slides. Yeah, the subject is the uh, is the cold uh, is the cold for mental wedge, and I will uh, talk about this uh, from five different perspectives, and talk about its temperature and petrology, and talk about its uh, 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 kinematics and how it does is it is not involved in mental wedge flow and its mechanical properties differ than the rest of the mental wedge, and also how it uh, uh, affects the uh, mega thrust behavior, of course, in deeper places, uh, and because of its, 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 uh, its depth, it's, it's pretty deep. So let's start with the, uh, the first uh, thing, the thermal pedagogic state. And the, uh, uh, the most fundamental to a subduction zone is a thermal contrast between the uh, cold fork and uh, and the very warm arc <coughs> arc and back arc and so that's the uh, uh, for any subduction zone that's the most important aspect the most fundamental to a uh, subduction geodynamics the reason for this contrast is uh, is the uh, we think is because the uh, the coupling state of the uh, mega thrust uh, above a certain depth, about 70, 80 kilometers, and the, the, the slab is decoupled from the materials <coughs> above it. The materials above it does not travel with the slab. Below that depth, uh, that depth, the mental wedge material uh, uh, begins to travel with the slab at the same uh, speed. So it's fully coupled, and it is not that coupling that uh, induces uh, uh, mental wedge flow, uh, as shown here. And if I can grab the laser, okay, yeah, uh, the mental flow here. And and because that this is fully coupled, uh, we no longer have a, uh, a distinct fault. It's just a shear zone here, and our fault in mega thrust has a certain depth. That means it's here. That's our mega thrust, and the shallower part is the uh, <coughs> uh, the colder part can produce earthquakes, of course. And because of the uh, uh, this uh, uh, mental flow here, and it brings heat from the back arc and, and greater depth, 
And as a result, all the subtraction zones are similar in this regard. And no matter where you go, the, the, the debugger gets always hot and the heat flow is high. And we have volcano in the arc. And the fork is always cold, but still the fork can be different between different subtraction zones. And, and it depend, depending on the, uh, uh, the age and thermal state of the incoming plate. And younger plate, uh, 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 plates are hotter, bringing, bringing in more heat, and colder plates are colder, and they cause a lot of differences. The most important difference is uh, how the, uh, uh, in the, the plate, subtracting slab, dehydrates. So let's look at the other uh, phase uh, diagrams of the uh, subtracting crust and subtracting, subtracting mantle. And, and uh, 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 here, uh, the numbers just mean the uh, uh, water bound, uh, bound in the minerals, right? And uh, you, you, you don't have to uh, worry about the details. What you see is uh, if you, uh, the blue area is basically metal basalt and the yellow is, uh, is eclogite. And, and so as, this, as we go into the slab goes to a, a greater pressure, that means depth or temperature, and it'll, the crust will, will change, change uh, uh, will have a transformation from uh, basalt to eclogite. The mantle part also have, uh, yeah, we have serpentine. If the mantle is, is hydrated before subduction, we have their serpentine materials, other hydrous minerals, and it will break down and to release water. But most water is from the, from the crust. And the difference between a young and cold subduction uh, slab, subduction slab is the dehydration depth. For when the slab is young, the, the, the salt eclogite transformation occurs at a shallower depth. When it's, when it's old, it occurs at deeper depth. And so they cause a lot of differences to, uh, to the fork. And, the, and, and most of the, as I said, most of the uh, uh, water released from uh, the slab is because of the dehydration of the, uh, the crust. And the mantle also has a contribution, but not as uh, 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 prominent as the uh, as the crust. Okay, now let's take uh, two uh, end member subduction zone to uh, show the the difference uh, differences uh, the age of incoming plate uh, causes. <clears throat> and so the uh, Cascadia is an end member young slab, a warm slab sub subduction zone, and uh, northeast Japan Japan Trench is the end member cold slab subduction zone. As you can see, uh, the back arc, the back arc area is uh, pretty similar, as I said, because of mental wedge flow, because of the coupling of the uh, 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 interface here. And, uh, but the fork is, is different. And when you here, when you see a blue and to a white change here, that means the basalt has been uh, transformed to eclogite here. And that's our uh, place area for peak dehydration. And for a cold slab, and it, it, it transfer does not, the transformation does not take place until much greater. When you see a, a purple, and that means the uh, uh, serpentine, this, in this case, the one particular serpentine antigoride is uh, stable under this temperature and, temp and pressure condition. It does not mean there must be serpentine there. It means if there's water, and serpentine will be stable under that condition. Okay, and because of the difference here, mainly in the uh, uh, dehydration depth of the crustal material, and what we uh, see is, uh, and it causes difference here. And shallow dehydration means, and there's really not a lot of water from the slab when the, when the uh, 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 mental wedge is uh, warm enough, hot enough to produce melts. And, and the, and the, for, for an older slab, and a lot of water is released when the, uh, in, the, in the area where the mental wedge is hot enough to produce melts. And therefore, for cold slabs, usually the uh, arc, arc, arc volcanism is a lot more active, with some exceptions. And uh, because the shallow dehydration and the fork mental wedge corner here, you see, you see the purple here means the uh, serpentine would be stable, right? If it gets water. And when the water gets into the fork uh, mental wedge corner and for young slab, because a lot of water gets in, so this area is expected to be highly hydrated. 
and serpentines and other hydrous minerals will form. But for cold slabs, even though a serpentine can be stable in that area, but uh, not, there's not enough water. So it's, it's much less hydrated than young slabs in the uh, uh, than, uh, warm slab subduction zones. So that's an important difference here. And the other difference, of course, is the uh, is a seismogenic zone depth. And for young slabs, because of the higher temperature and rheology, and, and the seismogenic zone uh, will end at much shallower depths than cold slabs here. And so all these uh, 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 characteristics are important for the uh, uh, for the uh, rest of the talk. We'll, we'll come back to these things uh, uh, from time to time. So uh, I think my, uh, uh, the first thing about the, <laughs> the thermal and petrologic state of the fork, fork mental edge is, uh, is, it, is it, that's my temperature component. Now let's move to the second thing about the uh, uh, kinematic state of the fork mental edge. As you can see from here, Mental edge flow because of the uh, the uh, the change in the from decoupling to coupling of the interface, and the mental edge flow induced mental edge flow does not, is confined to this area. It does not go into the uh, 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 the, the fork mental edge, and that's a prediction. And because we require that behavior because of heat flow, because of other observations and inferences. And, but uh, direct observation is difficult. And how do we observe it? And uh, we use uh, seismic anisotropy. And uh, most of you uh, probably know uh, seismic anisotropy. Uh, uh, in, this, in this case, shear uh, wave anisotropy probably uh, quite well. And uh, uh, basically, when you have a shear, shear wave traveling there, and the, the direction of uh, a particle vibration, and, and it is perpendicular to the wave travel direction, right? But uh, it'll split into two components, and one with one traveling faster, and the, uh, the vibration, particle vibration direction of the faster wave, and we call it the uh, uh, fast direction. And the other one, of course, this, uh, is a slow direction. And the, uh, the difference in time, uh, the, uh, of the arrival time of the two uh, fast and slow waves and can contain information and about the, the, the origin of the anisotropy. It basically tells the where the anisotropy, uh, at which, which depth the anisotropy uh, occurs. Okay, so this uh, uh, shear wave spinning has been applied to uh, many subduction zones. Let's take an example, uh, uh, go back to our <laughs> Cascadia subduction zone here. Uh, it, it, it was done uh, many years ago and with two uh, different earthquake sources, local earthquakes. Of course, it shallows uh, only the shallow, the shallow part of the system. You can also use teleseismic uh, with uh, the wave that travels uh, uh, through the mantle and outer core and mantle again and reaches this, our station, it samples a much deeper part of the system. And from these two studies, and they concluded in early days, uh, well, by the way, uh, 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 Claire Curry was a former PhD student here. Uh, what they found is uh, uh, from local uh, earthquake, the anisotropy, we see a, a margin parallel fast direction. And from the uh, analysis of a, a delay time, we can tell, and this is a pretty shallow, it's, it's the source of the anisotropy is really in, only in the, the, the crust of the upper plate. And from teleseismic anisotropy, and, and what they found is the uh, fast direction is, is just the opposite, it's margin normal, and the source is deep. And the interpre interpretation is like this. For the deeper anisotropy, SKS anisotropy, and interpretation is, is caused by a preferred orientation of olivine uh, in, the, in the flowing mantle. When the, when the mantle flow like this here, corner flow like that, or when the flows with the subduction uh, plate, yeah, and uh, it'll cause the olive in, in the in the mental material to have a preferred orientation. That preferred orientation will give rise to anisotropy, the fast direction. So that can be 
uh, fairly easily understood. And the shallow anisotropy, as I said, they are, uh, is in the crust. And the interpretation is, is has to do with the, uh, the state of stress, a direction of a maximum compression stress, which has happens to be margin parallel here. So uh, that can all uh, both shallow and deep can be explained. How about the, uh, the uh, forward mental wedge? And that could not be resolved because we did not have enough earthquakes and we did not have to, did not have enough uh, 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 stations. And and so that remains uh, unresolved. And if we want more earthquakes and more stations, and where do we go? Uh, of course, the most obvious place is Japan. And here's Northeast Japan. They have a lot of earthquakes, a lot of stations. They have so many stations. And, and, and here, uh, after the, uh, the big earthquake in 2011, the Tokuoki earthquake, and they installed a long cable system on the seafloor, including uh, with many, many seafloor size monitors ocean bottom seismometers here. And these seismometers were used uh, recently by my uh, Japanese colleague. I'm a co-author with him uh, in this uh, study of anisotropy. She will explain it. So all these, when you see all these uh, red squares, these are the stations that have that recorded the, uh, the signal and have been used for the analysis. And so a lot of stations here, and certainly a lot of earthquakes. There are so many earthquakes that they can afford to throw away a lot of the earthquakes that are regularly used in an isotropy study. So they did not use any earthquake within the uh, uh, subtracting plate, and, and they did not have to use any teleseismic uh, events. So the only source they use is exclusively earthquakes along the plate interface. The beauty is, if you use only these sources, you're guaranteed the anisotropy you eventually resolve is either in the crust or in the fork mental wedge. So there's hope to uh, resolve the, uh, the, the problem of uh, fork mental wedge anisotropy here. And uh, uh, based on uh, some previous work without using C process monitors, and they could already, they already knew that the, uh, the uh, anisotropy, the deeper area is margin normal, is like Cascadia. And from the new study, and they could tell the anisotropy is shallow, is margin parallel, again, again similar to Cascadia, but that's, I think that's, maybe it's, I don't know if it's coincidence. But anyway, it's very similar. And, uh, and, and as you, you can also see this, uh, uh, you can, if you can see these green lines, these are the, the traces of active faults. Uh, so the interpretation of the anisotropy results is like this, pretty similar to Cascadia for the yeah, for deeper anisotropy has, is, is caused by mental edge flow and preferred orientation for oligomer minerals, anisotropy margin normal anisotropy here. And the shallow anisotropy, again, from the delay time, uh, analysis is is all in the in the overlying crust. It's not in the uh, the, the mantle, in the crust. In this case, and they think it's uh, associated with the uh, margin parallel, uh, those active faults. So it's a rough fabric that causes that. But that's what's important is what happens <laughs> in the fork mantle wedge. And uh, because all the fork anisotropy is in the crust, that is with the conclusion that the, the fork mental wedge here, the cold mental wedge, has no anisotropy. And it, that means it is not involved in the, uh, the mental wedge flow. It is stagnant and it's consistent with uh, what is predicted with, by, uh, with the thermal petrological modeling. So that's the uh, the second the th uh, I think it was the second uh, aspect of the uh, the fork mental wedge I I talk about in this seminar. Now let's move to the third. Uh, the third thing <laughs> third thing is the uh, it's a mechanical uh, uh, property, and because the uh, fork mental wedge is cold compared to uh, the very hot uh, back arc and arc mental wedge. And we expect the uh, uh, mechanically it's going to be stiff, and uh, it's very it is it, quite amazing that uh, recently we're able to uh, to see this uh, from post seismic deformation. It really leaves a very strong, obvious uh, uh, geodetic signature. 
Okay, so when we study geodetic, uh, yeah, when we, when we study geodetic uh, 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 post seismic deformation, and we use uh, we consider uh, a model with uh, elastic plates, upper plate, dangling plate, and we uh, certainly we know the the mantle, the mantle, uh, the deeper part of the uh, the system, the, the thin sphere is, is basically elastic, so we have a basically elastic mantle wedge. And so, what about the uh, uh, this area of the mantle? And as I said, because because it's cold, and we assume and it's, it's elastic, uh, it's similar to the upper plate and dumbbell plate. So that's our system. So we, we call this an elastic cold nose. It's cold nose of the mantle wedge. And so with the uh, elastic cold nose, we can build a, a simple two-dimensional model uh, of uh, post seismic deformation. In this 2D model, assume we have uh, an earthquake that has a slip, cold seismic slip distribution like this over this area of the mega thrust. And that uh, slip, cosine slip, will cause deformation. And uh, five years later, and we'll still see uh, displacements, we still see a velocity because of the relaxation of the uh, viscoelastic mental wedge and, and deeper mantle. And that relaxation will cause uh, a flow in the mental wedge, but that flow is entirely different from the, uh, the flow, uh, the mental wedge flow that, uh, uh, well, that we, show, we, we, we showed earlier, and that flow is the background, and this is, a, uh, this is a perturbation on top of that background. It's not a background flow, it's just a perturbation. Okay, but that perturbation will cause deformation will, uh, 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 of, the, of the plate, upper plate, and uh, uh, if you observe it at the surface, at the ground surface with uh, geodetic observations, what you would see is uh, in the horizontal direction, you will see this uh, famous uh, posing motion and this area will move that way and this area move that way. But what's important to us in this park is the vertical component. What we see is uh, in the vertical component here, that's vertical deformation and uh, you know, five years after the earthquake, what we see is, uh, I think every time somebody joins, I cannot, I have to use this way to move on my slide. Anyway, so we see an, uh, a, a distinct uplift, uh, area of uplift uh, around the, uh, the edge of the cold nose here. So we see this uplift. And if we do not have this cold, uh, elastic cold nose here in the different model, and we do not have this uplift here. So this is the model without cold, uh, the cold nose. In this model, and you may you may argue, well, it, it causes too much a horizontal motion. It's probably too fast here, and no problem. We all we need to do is to uh, introduce a greater viscosity, assume greater viscosity for the mental wedge, and we can have a uh, horizontal deformation similar to uh, the Kono's case, but still we do not have this uplift here. So the uplift is certainly related with the, uh, the presence of the cold uh, elastic cold nose. And to understand why we focus on this, we zoom in on this area here, as you can see, in the presence of the elastic cold nose, the mental edge flow here uh, uh, associated with the basically elastic stress relaxation and uh, is deflected by the, the elastic cones to flow upward and the, and it causes the uh, over overriding uh, the, the crust to, to flow that way too that that's why we have we see this uh, vertical component here and without uh, the cold nose and the elemental edge flow will just happily uh, go seaward and without causing uplift so that's the, the fundamental cause for the, the uplift by the, due to the presence of the cold nose. Now we see some real examples. We go back to, again, we go back to Northeast Japan. And this is five years after that big earthquake, the Okie earthquake. 
And they have, of course, they have massive uh, GPS data and both a horizontal component, the vertical component. You see that's the uh, data is yellow and model prediction. Uh, also, it's a similar basically last model, but in three dimensional in this case, and model, model prediction is pretty good. And, and in this, uh, 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 because I work on Cascadia, I, I, I like to uh, view subduction, uh, uh, subduction from left to right. I think because you work on Sumatra, you must have the same feeling. So let's flip it. Now we have a left to right subduction here. And what's important and to today's subject is, uh, is the uplift here. We see both data and model prediction using the viscous elastic model here. And, and that uplift is the signature due to the presence of the elastic elastic uh, cold nose. Same as in the 2D model. If we, if we see the results along this uh, profile, and that's what we see. And, and the squares are, uh, symbols are observations, and the, the red line is the model prediction using the 3D based elastic pole size and deformation model. And uh, we, can, we have looked ar uh, around the, the globe to see we have other uh, examples and, and uh, to our, uh, 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 somewhat to our surprise, we really haven't seen any uh, uh, counterexamples. So everywhere we go, we see pole size and uplift in that area. The problem is for most places, there's not enough uh, observations. May, sometimes just one station, two stations, it's not enough to constrain the model. But in a few places, and we do have uh, enough data to allow uh, uh, model a model to be developed. And these are some of the examples. And one of them is actually, we got this data from uh, Luja and uh, Emma <laughs> from, from this group. And it shows, uh, even uh, the earthquake is small, but it still shows the uplift, some uplift signal here. So these are some examples, pretty consistent picture. And the most remarkable is here, is this one. And this is uh, an earthquake, the, uh, the, the largest recorded earthquake on Earth. 1960, magnitude seven and a half uh, Chile earthquake. And of course, and at that time, these, these were not GPS data. These are geological observations made by George Plafker, USGS, eight years after the earthquake. He went up and down the coast to see evidence for uh, uplift and, and subsidence. And from the, there's a lot of coastlines there and a lot of illness, everything. And, and he, he, he was able to constrain this. And that was a, a, a really a, a transformative uh, a, a data set that changed our view of a subduction zone and plate tectonics. It's a very, very important milestone study. And, and, and if you take a map view, all these, uh, uh, these uh, purple dots are George Plafker's uh, sites. Uh, observation sites. And here is the, uh, the counter lines, it's the, the latest uh, uh, cosine slip model uh, constrained by many data, especially uh, tsunami data globally. And it, by, by using uh, this uh, cosine deformation in the elastic model, we can predict cosine de co deformation. And the cosine deformation agrees pretty nicely with uh, what uh, George Plafker reported. Right. But George Plafker uh, went there eight years after the earthquake. But at that time, there was no uh, concept of pole size deformation. Everything was regarded uh, 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 being co-seismic. And so, and, and, and what, uh, what is uh, interesting is this area. And this is the area of the, around the edge of the cold, elastic cold nose uh, we know today. And we see this uh, uplift observed by George Plafker here, but no cosine deformation model can ever explain this. And because so far from the, from the trench, and there's still just no way we can have cosine uplift here, and physically impossible. So that has remained a history for, uh, for the past 50 years. And now with the understanding of the role of the uh, uh, cold, uh, elastic cold nose, the mystery is resolved. We, now we know uh, uh, with this, this uh, basically last 
a model, and that's the model prediction for a post seismic deformation eight years after the earthquake. It explains George Plasker's observation uh, very nicely. And as I said, George Plasker's deformation uh, observations were uh, 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 these, these are really paradigm shifting observations. And it's uh, so important. And that uh, 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 lot, I think two years ago, George Plasker was named one of the giants of technology physics by AGU. And it, it, uh, it, it really humbles me that uh, 50 years later, we are still learning from his uh, remarkable data. It's really, uh, when you think that way, it's, it's pretty humbling. Okay, so I've done my third uh, thing. Now let's go to uh, uh, the, the fourth and, and fifth, the road of uh, how the, uh, the mental fork, mental edge can if affect megathrust behavior. And the first thing is uh, ETS, but this is not new work. Uh, some of you may have already read the paper and, and know the story, so not very new, I just, but I still uh, uh, go through it and somewhat quickly. And you, I guess you all know ETS, Pisac's uh, Lip and Tremor. Uh, so let's start by recalling what we said about the contrast between uh, warm slab and cold slab subtraction noise. Two of the uh, important characteristics uh, differences uh, is the highly, highly hydrated mental wedge corner here in warm slab subjection zone and much less hydrated corner here for cold slab subjection zone. And the other important difference is the, uh, the termination depth of the mega thrust seismogenic zone. So these two, uh, these are two important characteristics uh, to our understanding of the geological background of ETS in this area. This is a global compilation based on, on theoretical calculations, prediction of the uh, hydration state of the mantle wedge corner. When you see blue, uh, blue that means uh, uh, there's much less hydration. When you see uh, uh, red, it's a lot more hydration. This is not capacity of, uh, uh, of the mental edge to, to absorb water, is how much, uh, 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 it's not a condition, not a PD condition. It, it, it's really how much water is available that determines this uh, state here. And as you can see, this red, all these red <laughs> areas, these are the, our, some of our warmest subduction zones, including Cascadia. And they happen to be subduction zones where ETS or assembly behavior is, uh, is most abundant. So what happens to the mental wedge corner in warm slab subduction zones? And this is what happens. And, and there's a lot of uh, uh, spinalization here, right? hydration here. And very quickly, because for such a small area, and we think the, uh, uh, it'll be fully serpentinized, so serpentine saturation here. And, and it, then the permeability will become very low here. And, but the, uh, the, the water is still coming from the slab and it will flow that way. And will, it, when it meets the other colder crust, it will deposit uh, uh, silica. That, that fluid contains a lot of silica. And uh, silica deposition will also reduce permeability. As a result, the permeability in this around the mental wedge corner becomes very, very low. And because very low permeability and water still coming, it, it causes a, a zone of a very high pore fluid pressure. It, it, that has important mechanical consequences. Without this uh, high, high pore fluid pressure zone, and what happened would be this, right? So the mega thrust will change from frictional behavior, can produce earthquakes here, and to semi-frictional, eventually to viscous here viscous behavior because the temperature is high. And for so for, uh, for warm slab subduction zones, like in this case is Cascadia, and the around mental wedge corner, the, uh, the, the, the mega thrust uh, would be viscous. The behavior would be viscous. And, and without uh, this high profit pressure zone, but because of the presence of high profit pressure and the, the frictional uh, strength will be much reduced, so it's easier for the fault to fail in a friction manner than viscous flow. So, 
as a result, we, we have a, a, a transition from friction and to, uh, 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 to uh, viscous, semi-viscous, and back to friction again. And, the, and, and that friction, because ETS, a slow slip, episodic slow slip is a frictional behavior. So we think, and this is the, the geological reason why that behavior can, and can be there around mental wedge corner. And, and, and the condi uh, uh, necessary condition for this is the, uh, the seismogenic zone must terminate before it reaches the, uh, the, uh, the mental wedge corner here. Yeah. And we see this in, in, in Nankai, Cascadia, and Mexico. And the, uh, the seismogenic zone termin terminates a shallow depth before the mental wedge corner. And around the mental wedge corner, we have either ETS in this or or ETS like behavior tremor, and and so that uh, that's the uh, uh, the role of the of the mental wedge in, in controlling the uh, megaflux behavior here. And if you go to a, a very a, a subduction zone with very cold slab, and the uh, the seismogenic zone goes all the way uh, way beyond the uh, the mental wedge corner, and we do not have that similar behavior. And I'll uh, skip the details, but uh, you get a message. You can read the paper to uh, see the uh, details of the argument. Okay, so let's keep going and to the, uh, on the uh, influence on the mega thrust. Now we go a, a little bit deeper, see how the, uh, the seismogenic behavior of mega thrust is influenced the, uh, by the, the, the mental wedge, uh, uh, fork mental wedge. And, here, now we take an, uh, uh, Chile as an example. We go to the area of the 2010 uh, Maui earthquake. That's a big earthquake here. What's shown here on, to the left is the, uh, uh, an average of eight published slip models for this earthquake. And from these models, we can tell the slip uh, occurred to at least 60 kilometers depth. It's pretty deep much deeper than those uh, warm, warm slab subtraction zones we just saw. However, what we can also derive uh, uh, a stress drop along microthrust from the slip model. And even though the slip goes to at least 60 kilometers, and the stress drop occurs mostly shallower than 40 kilometers, basically shallower than the MOHO, as I'll, I'll, I'll show later. So uh, uh, for deeper, deeper that's even though it slips, but slips uh, uh, passively, it, it, it's, it's, it's not actively involved in generating earthquake by slips, well, resisting slip by increasing its, its, its uh, stress, so stress increase. And so that's the, uh, the cold size behavior after the earthquake, a lot of recording of aftershocks. And these black ones are some of the better quality aftershocks. If we uh, cut a cross section here, we see the, the distribution of aftershocks better. And these aftershocks on the interplate, these are interplate forms. And, and uh, what we can see is uh, on here, there is a, there's a gap of aftershock. And, and so, and on, on, the same, on the same figure, we also show the, uh, the location of the fork uh, uh, moho here and derive determined from two receiver function studies along two profiles. Yeah, along these two, along these two profiles here. Yeah. And so from based on these studies, we think the, uh, the range of the moho depth is somewhere here, shown by this color here. And, and uh, because of the uh, spatial association with uh, the mental wedge corner, we think all this slip behavior has, is somewhat controlled by the, by the mental wedge, the forearc mental wedge. You may ask, uh, what we are talking about is, uh, is the behavior of a fault. And the mental wedge is a volume. And why does mental wedge affect the fault behavior? And, and, and the reason is this. The reason is uh, and the, the megathrust fault zone is not a single contact. 
it's a zone with the finite thickness. In this zone, there's materials uh, from the incoming plate, from the uh, subtracting sediment, materials from the upper plate, they form a melange, they have a pretty complex behavior. And once, the, once we go deeper than the, uh, the, the upper plate, the fork moho, and the fork a mental wedge material, uh, the bottom of the mental wedge can be uh, uh, incorporated into the megathrust fault zone. And that may affect the, uh, the megathrust behavior under certain conditions. So that's why the, uh, the, mega, the, the mental wedge uh, is important, can be important to uh, the megathrust behavior. Now we look at the, uh, the petrology of the mental wedge. Uh, really, we're, we're concerned with the, about the deeper part of the basal area of the mental wedge here. And, uh, and if, if, uh, if the water gets in here, we have a uh, sapinization here and other, other hydrous minerals here. Here's a diagram of uh, uh, serpentine uh, uh, phases. And we have different types of serpentine, serpentines. If you look at, uh, uh, well, we, can, we calculate temperature, of course, here. And, and this, the, uh, the, the solid line is temperature of this model along the plate interface that represents the uh, temperature of the base of the mental wedge. And you can have a, a somewhat different uh, results depending on what kind of uh, 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 friction coefficient you use for the mega thrust. Anyway, and once we go deeper than the moho here and the, uh, the base of mental wedge and has uh, uh, see some changes first, and uh, with the inter inter introduction of water, the base of the mental wedge uh, will have uh, uh, serpentine and minerals, uh, lizardite and chrysotile here. And, and, but as we go deeper, warmer and higher pressure and follow the temperature P, uh, PT profile, and the, these uh, serpentine materials will, will change gradually into a different type of serpentine and tigerite. And so in between, there's a transition. And, 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 and so that, that, uh, uh, that transition uh, is important. Whatever uh, uh, reactions we follow, right, either one or two, but uh, it's more likely the two because there are a lot of us uh, <coughs> fluids, aqueous fluids with silica in it. And but regardless of which reaction we, we, we consider, there is there's this zone of transition. And uh, that's important because of the, uh, uh, important to the uh, uh, mega thrust behavior because of their fr friction frictional properties. And based on a lot of laboratory experiments and, and connected, with, connected with various people, and we know that the lizardite or crystal tail uh, exhibits stable sliding behavior. They do not produce earthquakes. However, antigorite, even though it's still serpentine, but when the temperature is higher, especially a, a higher around about 40, 400 degrees, and it, it makes a bit unstable uh, slip, either because velocity weakening or, or other mechanisms. So, and so that because of this, this uh, 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 change in frictional behavior, uh, we think they may control the uh, behavior of the, uh, the mega thrust. And here we assume the, uh, the shallow part of the mega thrust here, the, well, the, the uh, uh, gets, uh, incorporates the, uh, the from the base of the mental wedge, mostly lizardite and maybe chrysotile here, material here. When we go deeper, it was incorporated into mega thrust, it becomes antigorite eventually. And they have different frictional behaviors. They may affect the frictional behavior of the mega thrust. And, and uh, basically, uh, we consider, and uh, don't leave the, mega uh, the, the mental wedge corner, and that the mega thrust material is a basically predominantly velocity strengthening because these materials in the normal conditions at this depth and uh, with somebody sediment or whatever metabasol, and they exhibit velocity strengthening behavior. They don't produce earthquakes, they don't like to produce earthquakes, but they can slip passively and, and they can rupture, uh, can allow rupture propagation in the, in a big earthquake such as 2010, but passively and with stress increase. And around the mental wedge corner, and we begin to have a lizardite and maybe some chrysotile. And, and the, uh, because they do not produce earthquakes and they may cause a aftershock gap here. 
In further down depth, we anticipate an antigrade patches in the fault zone here, and they may have a seismogenic behavior and they can produce uh, uh, aftershocks. So this is how we think the, uh, the mental wedge uh, petrology may control the megathrust behavior in, the deep, in this deeper part. And so far I have covered all my five uh, aspects about the cold fork mental wedge. And so I welcome uh, questions. Thank you.